OK, so thanks. Thanks very much, everybody, for attending. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I normally start the meeting with introductions, but I think um, we're going to, I'm, if, with your permission, I'm just going to change the agenda around slightly and start with Chair's announcements. Um, so as many of you will know, Councillor Nuala Fen Fenley, a valued and valuable member of this board for many years, died this week following a short illness. Nuala, as Cabinet Member for Children and Young People, was passionate and determined to ensure that every child and young people had the best possible start in life. Her contribution to this board was to constantly remind us, question us and challenge how would what we are doing affect children. One of the items on the agenda today, carers, was very dear to Nuala's heart and we had many conversations about young carers and Nuala didn't want anyone to have to be a young carer, but if they did, then it shouldn't affect their life chances and opportunities. And I know when she did her school's visit, she always asked the head, did they know who their young carers were and how they were being supported? Her support for young people's voices to be not just heard as an afterthought or a nice to have, but for Nuala, having young people determine how services, support and activities should be delivered, the way engagement should be done. She wanted them to be in charge and our role was to support them to enable this. The engagement and participa participation legacy that Nuala leaves is immense. Many, many tributes have already been pouring in from across Doncaster from both organisations, individuals and groups, many highlighting the impact she has made on so many children and others remembering her for her kindness and friendship and being the most loveliest person. I know many of you will have your own memories of Nuala, so please feel free to say anything throughout the meeting. Um, I don't know if wish anybody wished to say, any, say anything, um, but I was just going to ask us all if we could all have a minute's silence to remember Nuala. That's OK. OK, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, um, and as knowing Nuala as we uh, did, remembering obviously as a colleague and dearest friend, um, I think you thank you for doing that. Um, and as Nuala would expect us to do, we're going to have uh, to get on with the business of the meeting now and ensure really we do think in our discussions today about children and young people and ask the questions that she would be expecting us to ask. So back to uh, the agenda. Um, and as always, when I start these meetings, I start with introductions. Um, so not just for people that are on the board, um, but for people that are attending as well. So everybody knows who everybody is. Um, I think most of you have been here before know that these meetings are quite informal. Um, and I will get us through the agenda, um, but equally, I really want us to have the opportunity um, to have a really good discussion, think about how this improves health and well-being, and throughout the course of the meeting, really think about um, what can your organisation do, and that includes everybody, police colleagues, housing, if they were here, everybody, what can we do on this agenda to really support everybody's health and well-being? So we'll start with introductions and my participants are showing now. So I'm Rachel Blake. I'm Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and um, I'm also Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. 
I'll just go down my list if that's all right. So it'd be like a um, school. I'll just shout your first name out and hopefully there's only one person with that first name and just say you who you are and your organisation, please. So, um, Andrew. Hi, thank you, Rachel. My name is Andrew Goodall. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Healthwatch Doncaster. I'm deputising today for Steve Shaw, who's the Chair of Healthwatch Doncaster. Thanks very much, Andrew, and welcome. Um, Nigel. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Councillor Nigel Ball, Cabinet Member for Public Health, Leisure and Culture. Um, as I say, good morning. Thank you, Nigel. And the next member of the board is Kath. Hi, Kath Witherington from Voluntary Action Doncaster. Hi, Kath. Nice to see you again. Hi, Kath. Um, Phil? Hello everyone, I'm Phil Holmes, I'm the Director of Adults Health and Wellbeing in Doncaster Council. Hi Phil, uh, obviously nice to see you as well Phil, I should say that shouldn't I? So, <laughs> mad if I didn't. Uh, Only if you mean it Rachel. I also mean it Phil. Lucy? Hi, I'm Lucy Robertshaw from Darts Doncaster Community Arts and I sit on the Health and Wellbeing Board as the Health and Social Care Rep. Welcome Lucy. Um, Rihanna? Good morning, Rihanna Nelson, Director for Learning Skills and Opportunities and Secretary DC. Welcome, Rihanna. Um, Nicholas, is it Nicholas or Nick? Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's Nick Maddox. I'm the Ops Chief Inspector at the minute at uh, Doncaster College Road, uh, deputising for Chief Superintendent Mel Palin today. Nice to see you, Nick. And um, you. And you. Richard. Yeah, good morning everyone. I'm Richard Parker. I'm Chief Executive for Doncaster and Bassett Law Teaching Hospitals. Welcome Richard, nice to see you as well. Um, and then Catherine. Morning, Catherine Singh, Chief Executive of Ardash. Hi Catherine, love to see you. Are you there? It's, everybody keeps changing on the screen, don't you? More people come up. It's a test of my abilities. Uh, Rupert. Yeah, good morning. So, Rupert Suckling, Director of Public Health here in Doncaster. OK, and then we have a number. We have uh, Jonathan. Still there. Morning. morning, everyone. Yeah, Jonathan Goodwin from the Council's Governance team. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And Sarah. Morning, Sarah Maxfield from Governance Services, and I'll be taking the minutes for the meeting. Hi, Sarah, thank you. And then we've got a number of people attending to present. So we'll we'll do that as introductions now. So Ben, uh, Ben Brown. Hello, I'm the um, Doncaster Safeguarding Children Partnership uh, Board Manager. Welcome, Ben. You're you're obviously presenting the children safeguards in. Yeah, the annual Yes. Jeffrey. Oh, I can see you there, Jeffrey. Hello. Morning, Jeffrey Johnson, co-chair of the Care Strategic Oversight Group. Hi, Jeffrey. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um. George, do you want to say who you are? Yeah, morning, Chair. Uh, my name's George Tor. I'm a reporter at the Doncaster Free Press and Associated well, Newspapers. Good to have you here, George. Um, Kay. Hi, my name's Kay Kirk and I'm the Chair of the All Carers Action Group. Hi, Kay. And Kay and Geoffrey are here to present the Carers art, uh, item, which is good. Which, Louise? Hi, Louise Robson. I'm from the public health team and I work in Rupert's team and support the board. Hi, everybody. Yes. Thanks, Louise. And Angela. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Angela Wade. I'm the Carer Strategic Lead for Doncaster Council, but very much working in partnership to um, ensure all like carers are cited across all delivery areas. OK, welcome, everybody. I think I've, as, as everybody said hello, I've not missed anybody, have I? Anybody new come in? No? OK, so we will move on to uh, so properly back onto the agenda. Um, so we've had, had apologies from Dr David Crichton and Chief Superintendent Mel Palin, but Nick is here instead. Um, we've also had apologies from Cynth Councillor Cynthia Ransom and Dave Richmond from St Ledger. Do we have any other apologies, please? No chair, not that we're aware of. OK, lovely. Um, so on to housekeeping. I can see that everybody is um, able to hear OK. 
we can hear everybody else okay and um if people can just put themselves on mute while we're having the if you're not speaking that would be really useful thank you and obviously use the raise your hand function um to make sure uh, once i see your hand up i'll write you down so i can make sure that i can ask people make sure that I ask people to speak in the order that they've put their hand up because there's nothing more frustrating than sitting there thinking I've had my hand up for ages and the chair's not seen me. The meeting is re being recorded so if you can't sleep too well um, you can watch yourself again on the council's YouTube channel. Um, and then on to item two and I do have one other announcement that the board is obviously aware that on the 11th of February this year the Department of Health and Social Care published the white paper Integration and Innovation Working Together to Improve Health and Social Care for All. This sets out legislative changes for a new health and care bill. The proposals are designed to support our health and care system to work together to provide high quality health and care so that we live longer, healthier, active and more independent lives. Many of the proposals build on the NHS's recommendations in its long term plan, which I'm so sure many of you are extremely familiar with. Um, there will be a lot of work for health colleagues in particular to do to prepare for these changes anticipated to be in place by April 2022. Um, and obviously the board will want to be involved in the development of proposals in order to ensure, ensure the best possible outcome um, for Doncaster people um, and I, I think I spoke to Rupert about this and this is something that we'll be looking at more in from June onwards won't we Rupert. Thanks Rupert. Yeah that's uh, that's right Rachel so I suggest we do put it on the forward uh, plan uh, it's also worth uh, remembering that there are two key uh, products that this board is responsible for that will help shape that partnership one is the health and well-being um, strategy uh, and the other is the joint strategic needs assessment and I do suggest that in June we uh, receive a paper on the proposals for refreshing both of those documents and the timeline uh, to do that. I know there's a lot of other things going on uh, but those are going to be key uh, inputs for us to uh, have to not only support ourselves to work uh, in Doncaster but also to work collectively um, across uh, South Yorkshire and hold the ICS to account as well. So if that's okay Rachel uh, we'll we'll organise for that to go on to the forward plan. Yeah that'll be great. Thank you Rupert. Anybody else got any points comments on that? No, OK, I'll move on on to uh, item three. There are no items on today's agenda where the press and public are to be excluded. Um, and then on to item four, public questions. Do we have any members of the public that would like to ask a question? I'm not seeing anything, anybody? No, OK. We will move on to item five. If anybody does have any disclosable pecuniary interests, pecuniary interests even, or other interests to declare in relation to today's business, um, please ask Sarah, who's supporting the meeting, for a declaration form. Then on, can't see anybody that's indicating that, thank you. So on to item six which are minutes of the health and wellbeing meeting held on the 14th of January. Uh, the minutes of the board's last meeting are attached at page one of the agenda papers. The board is asked to consider and approve these as a correct record. People happy to do that? I've got a nod, a nod from Nigel, thank you. Okay, so we will move on to the uh, agenda and the items properly. So on to item seven, which is direct impacts of COVID-19 and Rupert is going to provide an update uh, with regard to the direct impacts in Doncaster and the steps being taken to address them. And whilst Rupert's thinking, uh, we've got to think, whilst Rupert's presenting, we need to be thinking about just noting the presentation, but please do think about any questions that you want to ask Rupert. Thanks Rupert. OK, thanks. Thanks, Rachel. So it's good to um, just cast our minds back to where we were in January when we last uh, met. Um, we were one week into a national 
lockdown and that was in response to increasing uh, case rates of COVID-19 and increasing hospitalizations and deaths and uh, the rates in Doncaster at that time uh, we had a case rate of uh, just over 300 per 100,000 there were well over 100 people in the acute hospital with active COVID and up to a dozen in intensive care. Um, and uh, when we met last, we were looking at not only the that first week of the lockdown, but also we were really ramping up some of the vaccination uh, campaign. Um, and it's I suppose it's good news uh, today, two months uh, on uh, Rachel, in that the combined impact of the lockdown and the uh, large scale vaccination programme means that today the rates uh, across Doncaster are under 100 per 100,000. And in particular, the rates in people over 60 is below 50 per 100,000. And uh, the rates in our older people have gone from being sort of twice what the uh, uh, overall average was to actually being half what the overall average is. And that is definitely testament to the impact of not only the vaccination campaign, but also the, the lockdown and the way Doncaster people have uh, really sort of, you know, uh, kept to the rules in the vast uh, majority of uh, cases. Uh, and that's definitely a sort of testament to all the work that's happened uh, in Doncaster. Um, this uh, week's obviously seen the start of step uh, step 1A in terms of releasing of restrictions and people will be aware that uh, schools have reopened. Uh, on Monday we had 95% of primary school children attending and 40% uh, of secondary school children attending. Uh, it's worth knowing that secondary schools have got a staggered uh, return this week and that number is going up gradually but some of the year groups won't return until Friday as school as secondary schools are implementing testing for those uh, um, uh, children as they return. Uh, there's also been a small change to uh, the guidance for visiting in care homes allowing uh, one nominated individual to uh, actually hold hands uh, with a resident um, uh, and that's a that's a sort of um, subtle but significant uh, shift, uh, and it's good good to see that's uh, coming in. And then the other thing that uh, impacts Doncaster to a certain extent is uh, clarification around uh, reasons for foreign travel. Uh, so uh, there are occasional flights still going from Doncaster Sheffield Airport and there are reasons, uh, legitimate reasons for foreign travel, including on business grounds and compassionate grounds. Uh, and people now have to sort of self-certify for the reasons why they are uh, traveling. So that's um, th that's uh, good um, sort of to, to see that. Uh, however, as uh, the Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty has been um, saying this week, it's a sort of fragile step um, in terms of reopening and easing those restrictions. So uh, this week, I, w I don't expect our case rates to fall much further. Um, and that's because uh, even though cases in the over 60s may continue to fall, we will definitely identify more cases in children this week as they return to school and, and are tested, particularly in that secondary school age group. And, uh, you know, there are already um, schools that have had to close bubbles because they have found uh, positive uh, cases. So I think over the next sort of uh, fortnight, we'll probably see a sort of stabilisation in terms of our uh, uh, case rates. The other thing to just to bear in mind is that uh, the last time we had rates of about 100 or just under 100 per 100,000 was in the middle of uh, September. And uh, although we hadn't got the lockdown, we hadn't got the vaccination, it only took three weeks for the rates to go from 100 to over 600 per 100,000. And that's why the easing of restrictions needs to be, um, you know, on the sort of current uh, sort of timetable, uh, giving us a chance to see what the impacts are locally. 
So, but having said that, this do, I mean it does mean that we have time to plan for what's coming up. So uh, next dates in the future roadmap are the 29th of March, and then more importantly, uh, for many people, will be the 12th of April, where uh, lots of the retail will reopen, gyms will reopen, uh, pubs will be able to serve uh, outdoor uh, hospitality. And certainly this is this is the time where our um, environmental health um, you know, licensing colleagues and our police colleagues are now starting to put the plans together about how to support the, the you know, the safest reopening of Doncaster uh, possible. Uh, so 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 it's definitely a, a good time to uh, plan. Uh, the other thing that we will be uh, doing, uh, Rachel, is we will be trying to we will be trying to get the rates down even lower. There are some particular challenges in that uh, there's um, a large uh, proportion of the Doncaster uh, sort of working age population uh, because of the types of jobs that they do still need to go out to work and they're unable to work from home. Um, and we will be looking at a sort of a neighbourhood level about what more we might be able to do to support people. Um, and that includes advice around, uh, you know, social distancing, advice to premises, uh, but also bringing in uh, as much local testing as we can and also then supporting people to self-isolate uh, should they need to. And that includes um, so, uh, the practical support to self-isolate, financial support to self-isolate and psychological support to um, self-isolate. Um, good to see Jack is here as I'm just about to uh, um, raise the vaccination uh, programme. So um, uh, Jackie will have the up-to-date uh, numbers, uh, but you know, there's been a, you know, a massive effort by all our NHS colleagues uh, and many other partners to um, support the rollout of the, the vaccination programme. Uh, over 100,000 uh, first uh, dose and uh, Jackie and the team will not only be extending the uh, people eligible for first doses, but the second doses will be uh, happening too. So Jackie, I don't know if you want to say anything um, uh, particular about the vaccination uh, program? Uh, I'll, I'll start by saying I'm very, very sorry I'm late, but it's good to see everybody. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Rupert's still on my thunder a bit. I was going to say we have got to our 100,000 vaccine point in Doncaster over the last week. Uh, we are, um, second doses are really starting to crank up again uh, as well this week because the vaccination program started the 14th of December in Doncaster and we wait, had to wait 11 weeks for sec mainly for second doses. So really um, over the next uh, few weeks, uh, the, the, va the vaccine availability um, becomes a lot more robust as well. So um, from next week and the week after, we will be seeing a lot more first doses and a lot more second doses as well. Uh, the expectation is that everyone over the age of 50 will have been offered their first dose by the 15th of April, and we are on track to deliver that. And that everyone in the rest of the you know, every, the rest of the population over uh, 16. Uh, will have been offered the vaccination by the 31st of July and we're also confident that we've got the um, capacity to deliver that if we get the vaccines flowing in Doncaster. We're also getting some pharmacies up and running in the patch uh, but we're not we, we just go through that process with NHS England at the moment we haven't got that confirmed yet but we'll probably start with uh, we're hoping to start with three or four pharmacies early in April at the latest. Um, and we may get more of those um, coming on stream as well, but we just haven't got that finalised yet. I'm not aware of the detail. Uh, so a huge thank you to everyone um, because it has been a massive team effort, this. There's absolutely no getting away from it. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not, obviously I don't know what Rupert said before I got here, but he's absolutely having an effect and an impact and we just need to keep going and we need to encourage everybody to come for their vaccines. We've established uh, an inequalities group as well in Dog Street, met for the first time yesterday, and that's just to make sure that we're tackling those hard to reach groups and making sure that we're getting as many people vaccinated as we possibly can. Um, so just a massive team effort and we just need to keep going and uh, not take our foot off the gas uh, at this point in time. 
um, and uh, not sure yet also I don't, again not sure what Rupert said but uh, not sure what will happen uh, once the 31st of July has uh, been and gone and whether booster doses etc are going to be expected but the science you know scientifically we, we're not aware yet uh, what the requirements will be um, which is a bit of a shame but it, it is what it is but no doubt we will respond um, together again whatever the ask will be so so massive thank you and, and it's going really well okay Rupert did you just say uh, th thanks thanks for that update uh, Jackie I suppose the key thing that we'll be also um, thinking about just as we go through these next few months is that although um, the changes may feel um, significant for some, for many people, uh, it, it will actually be very little change for them. So the continued impact on uh, people's mental health, uh, the impact around social isolation and loneliness is still something that we need to uh, to address. And it's good that we've got the safeguarding uh, reports on the agenda later, as that's still a, still a major concern uh, for us all, as well as the support for, for carers. So, um, you know, whilst it's good news about the the numbers uh, the impact of lockdown and restrictions will still have um, health impacts that we need to be aware of and respond to. Uh, Rupert just to add to that and I know Catherine's on the call but we're actively working with our DASH colleagues as well to, to see how we can extend the um, offer of some services such as IAPT etc so to make sure that as people come you know we get out of this that we have got some additional capacity in the system to be able to support those individuals that need it. So, so again, it is the, you know the vaccine program is going great, but we, we're not forgetting about that recovery side as well. Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much, Rupert and Jackie. Has anybody got any additional points, questions that they want to ask? This is your opportunity. No, I can see that Rihanna let us know about that we are, let me just find the message if people didn't see it, school attendance across the board is above national average, which is great work from our schools and engagement from parents, which is really good. Um, so it, it, compared to the conversations we've had at previous health and wellbeing boards, it really is, is good news. I think it's really good that we're looking at those inequalities. Um, I think we've all seen lots of information in the press and what's reported nationally about how um, certain groups aren't accessing for, for, for a variety of reasons and I think there tends to be an emphasis on race and ethnicity but I'm well aware that there are many other groups for very you know important reasons and not accessing that service and I think what is good now is that we have that community transport service in place for people I know that were struggling and I've raised it before with, with Jackie and Rupert that weren't able to get to the vaccine centres but that community transport is there now. Um, also good about the care homes because I know as counsellors we've certainly had lots of people contacting us you know not seeing loved ones for a year um, and hopefully that that will just increase and you know more than one person can see um, rather than you know than what happens now. OK, and as you say, Rupert, the fact that we've achieved this is is really about Doncaster people doing what they've been asked to do, which is, is which is really good news. Um, and the vaccination programme is something that people feel really proud about in Doncaster and how well it's working. Um, and, I, and I, you know, the way all partners have come together is absolutely fabulous. And I think what we've also had in Doncaster is the number of volunteers that have come forward. You know, I speak to people that don't work in health and social care, but have volunteered. Um, and I think we wouldn't have been able to do it probably with a lot of their support. Um, and we just hope perhaps that the government learns lessons in terms of how to do things. And if you use who's on the ground and knows their local communities, then uh, it shows how effective things can be. Unless anybody's got any other points or questions. We'll move on. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you, Jackie. So we're now going to move on to uh, item eight, which is our carers update. Um, our presenters are Geoffrey, Kay, Angela, but I see Valerie has joined us as well. Um, and uh, they are going to present this item, um, looking at how we can strengthen our system wide support for family carers. And as always, if we can be thinking as we're going through the presentation, because what we're being asked to consider 
is to consider and discuss what could be done through each of the members' respective areas, so each of our respective areas, to provide good information for family carers, and that obviously involves young carers as well, e.g. update websites with suite of care information. What could, what could we do to identify and ensure carers are supported well in our uh, areas of work? What actions, and equally where we've been mandated to do things, what can we do better? What actions can members commit to during this to meet meeting to support identifying and supporting carers more? And could all members show their commitment to the Doncaster Carers Charter by completing a virtual sign up and promoting the fact in members respective areas? So I think the four of you are probably going to explain that all to us. Um, so over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have the slides, please? I'm just trying to load those, Geoffrey, now. They should be coming right. online. Hopefully you'll be able to see them. Can you see those? Not yet. Ah, okay. uh, yeah. Some, something's happening. Something's happening, yeah. Angela. Yeah, oh, good. It. I can see them, but you guys can't I can yet. see them. <laughs> yeah, I've got it. Thank you, Angie. OK, great. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Geoffrey Johnson, and I'm the co-chair of the Carer Strategic Oversight Group and I will be talking today about carers. Could we have the next slide please Angie? Uh, this is the summary slide. I'm going to refer to engage with carers. Um, it, it is important that we adopt a partnership approach to work with carers in which the role of the carer alongside their expertise and understanding of the person they care for is recognised. Engaging with the care at all times will produce the best results. Uh, I'm going to give examples of engaging with the carer. Uh, recognise and respect the carer. Ensure information is shared with the carer and other professionals. Signpost information for the carer and help links professionals together. Flexible care, available to suit the carer and the person they care for. Think about the old family, including young carers and young adult carers. Recognise that the carer may need help both in their caring role and in maintaining their own health and well-being. Respect, involve and treat the carer as an expert in care. And treat the carer with dignity and compassion. I'll be showing a working example of engaging with carers further on in the presentation. Next slide, please, Angie. Who is a carer? I'm going to read the first paragraph of this slide for anyone who may be listening on the telephone. The definition of a carer is a person who provides unpaid help to someone due to frailty, physical or mental illness, substance use or disability. This includes children and adults who looks after a family member, partner or friend. Many carers do not see themselves as carers and it takes them an average of two years to acknowledge their role as a carer. It is therefore important that we identify carers at the earliest opportunity and provide information and support at source in primary, secondary, social care and in our schools. There are around 700,000 young unpaid carers for five to, seven, five to 17 years old in England. Today, our youngest carer in the borough is six years old. It will be interesting to see the results of the current census this year for all ages of carers, both nationally and in the Doncaster Borough. There are currently an estimated 250,000 carers, one in five, working in the National Health Service, many of whom are aged between 45 to 64 and so are likely to be among the most experienced and skilled staff. One in seven are in the general workforce. These numbers 
are projected to increase in the next 30 years to one in three. Next slide, please, Angie. This slide is re the results of a carer survey that was sent out to our 39 GPRE practices in October 2020 and was completed by 34 respondents. Young carers are often unseen. They do not tell relatives, friends, teachers, GPs or other health and care professionals about their responsibilities because of a fear of separation, guilt, pride, or for one reason or another. Therefore, we need to make it easier for young adult carers and young carers to come forward and identify themselves to their GP surgeries. Not all carers are identified by their GP practice. And one reason is the uncertainty around the definition of the term carer. Also, many carers may not readily identify themselves as a carer. Good practice, keeping an up-to-date carers register to routinely offer all carers a flu vaccination, regular health checks and anxiety and mental health screening is important, especially during the pandemic and to receive the COVID vaccination. Care awareness training included in GP surgeries with a dedicated care coordinator. I've included an IPA link in the slide to the Care Quality Commission website for Caring for Carers. It shows the six quality markers that the general practice use to demonstrate how they identify and support carers at the CQC inspection. Next slide, please, Angie. Examples of best practice. Uh, leading NHS trusts have developed their own carer pathways. I've included an example of best practice at the East, North and Hertfordshire NHS Trust. It is really encouraging with useful information, which they have fully involved unpaid carers and other organisations. Please follow the link, which will take you to the East and North Hertfordshire NHS Trust website. There is also a link to supporting our working carers in the National Health Service. We ask each individual on the Health and Wellbeing Board to show their commitment to the Doncaster Carers Charter. It sets out the commitment agreed by organisations across Doncaster to support a joined up approach to meet the health and wellbeing needs of carers. Please follow the link to the Doncaster Carers Charter to show your commitment. Next slide, please, Angie. This is the East and North Hertfordshire Trust Single Carers Pathway. This is a co-produced approach for working with carers who have lived in experiences and understanding of the patient's needs are recognised and taken into account when planning patient care, treatment and discharge. The Trust believes a carer should feel valued, respected and confident when they enter the hospital environment. On the right hand side of the slide, if you click the carer's handbook, this informs the carer what they can expect and includes a variety of information. If we are to build an NHS that is fit for the future, then carers must be full partners in the way we deliver care. Next slide, please, Angie. I would like to introduce Kate Kirk, who will give a carer's perspective. Hi, everyone. So I'm Kay, and today I'm going to talk about um, my caring role for my late husband. 
I cared for my late terminally husband over 10 months and he spent five days in hospital before he died with me by his side. The nurses were very kind and really looked after the patient, my late husband. They completed the relevant documentation and then I had a few moments on my own with him. Looking back now, I was in shock. I'm sorry, it does upset me a bit. You can feel so alone and it's so final. As I left the room, I noticed the nurses were really busy and I quietly left to go home as I am a carer for my son and I still care for him now. What would have helped some information about a newly bereaved carer, a carer's passport? I'm really sorry, it does get very emotional. It's okay, if you want to carry on, Kay. Oh, I'm on. You just take your time, Kay. It's absolutely fine. Look into the future. A carer can a carer role can have an everlasting impact on the carer. And it's really important that they can see people are helping them. Some good work has been achieved. So it's crucial everybody here today becomes part of that journey. So I think the question from it from me as a current carer and I was a child carer from being 13 looking after my Down syndrome brother. How can we all work together to improve carers lives to make this happen? Thank you. Thanks very much Kay. I think we'd all like to thank uh, Kay for that. Uh, the uh, carer's perspective. Um, could we have the next uh, slide, please, Angie? And I'd like to thank you all for listening to both uh, myself and Kay. Um, any questions, please? OK, so this is an Thank you very much, Jeffrey and Kay. Um, and I think what we, we've talked about, um, I know Lou and Louise and I for a long time, to make sure that when we when we discuss things at the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, that carers, whether it's carers issues or any other lived experience, the person's here rather than having um, somebody third hand relaying it. And I think having you both here makes that all the more powerful. So thank you for giving up your time to do that. We are now going to have a detailed discussion, I hope, and if people, I will bring people in to ask them in terms of their organisation. Um, so the first hand up was Lucy and then I've got Valerie. Lucy, yeah. over to you. Thank you. Um, it was really, really good hearing from you both, Geoffrey and Kay. Um, uh, it hit home, I suppose, as well, because I am a family carer. I care for my daughter who has Down syndrome. I am like Kay's brother. Uh, she's 13 now. Um, and I, you know, balancing work and homeschooling and COVID, etc. Um, it is even harder than it was before. So, you know, I know how hard it was even before the pandemic, but, but now it is much, much harder. I think there's some really important stuff in there about the way that the focus on services tends to just go on the person that you are caring for and that ability for somebody to actually say so how are you and how are you doing and let's think about your needs whether that be kind of that regular health check that you're talking about Jeffrey because we as carers tend to push all of that aside and focus on the person that we're supporting um, and I was really interested in the kind of the anxiety and mental health screening thing that you were talking about as well just those regular points like the flu vaccinations where carers can just sort of be regularly reminded or, or or encouraged to kind of come in um and we're doing a lot at darts so we work at darts at the point so we've been working with carers really for the last sort of 30 years through the singing from memory stuff that we do with adults with dementia and their family carers with children and young people with disabilities so we will definitely be signing up to the charter um and if you want to talk anymore just um get my email address and we can set up a meeting or something and thank you very much for sharing it was really really interesting and very vital yes if I could just respond to um, the carers uh, register um, at the last uh, carers action group, uh, one of our carers informed us that she'd been on the carers register at a GP practice for many years 
and she actually contacted her GP practice to ask them if she was there on the register and she wasn't. She was no longer on the register, mm. um, which then causes then a problem because of um, the COVID vaccination then for the uh, mm. carers to be uh, called up. Mm. So there does appear to be, you know, a problem there. And of course, as you've uh, explained that, you know, uh, being a carer, it's even more difficult uh, during, over the last 12 months because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore, it's even more important that we actually have the people in the GP practice for the mental health uh, screening. OK, thanks, Geoffrey. Sorry, Lucy, did you want to come Sorry. back? One thing I was going to say as well, because it's very interesting. So I'm on the I made sure very early on when Emily was born that I was on the GP register uh, as a carer. But um, my GP service are amazing, but it hasn't made any difference. I've had no other contact. It was me that had to ring in terms of sort of getting the COVID vaccination, etc. So even if you get somebody on it, the GP practices need to make sure that there's some some regular kind of check ins and what exactly to be expected as a carer. Thank you. Yeah, because um, just going back, sorry, just uh, going back to that, uh, uh, one, I do actually, you know, speak to people, uh, you know, uh, being involved with carers. Um, one person actually went to the GP practice and said, uh, you know, my son's got uh, mental health problems. And the receptionist turned around and said, um, well, that uh, doesn't, you're not a carer. So, you know, didn't put her on the carer's register, mm -hmm. which... That all falls down uh, in the GP practice that uh, we really need um, training in GP practices and the carers coordinator. Yeah, thanks, Geoffrey. Right, I've got a number of hands up. So I've got Valerie next, then Phil, Kath, Jackie and Andrew. If anybody else wants to make a point, please just put your hand up as well and I'll come to you. So Valerie, you're next. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you loud yeah, and I can't see you. Yeah, my video's gone off and I don't know why. Uh, right, um, I'm Valerie Wood and uh, I know some people do know me. I am a carer. Um, I care for my husband who's got MND. Um, uh, COVID experience has been uh, not a good experience for us. Um, we've been, my husband's been shielding for over a year now. He's also had a heart attack and been in hospital during this time. Um, so what it has had effect on both our, our mental states as well. I think I can tie a few things up, I think, uh, um, as regards to this. I read recently the COVID vaccination um, deployment programme as regards to unpaid carers. Um, I found what I found most interesting, because for those who do know me, know I've been campaigning for carers for some years now. Are you still there? Oh, yeah, we can hear yeah, you. Listening. Oh, it's all right. I'm just... Yeah. Uh, and I think... What I keep hearing and what I've been doing is about GPs registers and how we're supposed to be registered. But what I found really enlightening in this, there is an assumption on the government with this vaccine um, document about they expected us to gather information on the carer's flag. And I wondered, what's this carer's flag? Now, there's an assumption by the government that every GP flags up carers. Now there is a digital um, system within GPs that are supposed to put a flag. When they say register a carer, they're supposed to put a flag on their system for carers. So this where we've been going through in, with the COVID, where we've, have, we've told them we're a carer, they were supposed to flag us. So all then they had to do was press a button and all these little flags would have come up and has told everybody in their GP practice who was a carer. Now, the government expected good practice, and this is all from the carer's action plans throughout all these years, but that's never been done. Now, what I want to find out is how many GPs have actually used that flag, and if that's possible to find out. And if not, why can't it be used now? Mm -hmm. And also, that's for the existing carers. During this COVID, where uh, unpaid carers are supposed to be registering as a new carer, 
It also says within this document, having found new carers, they assume that the procedures for care assessments and follow through would be done. So is there now been an increase of people being referred to because I know they don't do care assessments. So is there now an increase of people being referred for care assessments because of these new unpaid carers are being found, there should be some way of finding out if there's been an increase of people referred on to carers, um, organisations and uh, social services. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Salary. Is can and, oh, and the local authority for adult social service is supposed to be the lead responsibility for correlating all this information. Now, somewhere along the way, you should now have a list of unpaid carers in order to be enabled to vaccinate us. So somewhere you must have a list of us all now. Okay. Are you okay, Valerie, if I ask Jackie and Phil that question? Yep. Because Jackie had a hand up anyway. So is that okay, Phil? If I just go to Jackie about the GPs yes. first. I think um I think Phil had his hand up first. So. He did, but yeah. Yeah, I mean so, so I mean there's so much in there what we've just had. So I'm just gonna yeah. try and go through a few bits really. Um I think some of the um points that have been raised uh, around carers and general practice. Um, I, I mean, we've got a comms and engagement committee that sits under our board, and I just wonder if we open the offer for you to come and talk to that group so that we can sort of really get some understanding and then, you know, about and, and also what the carers charter is and that sort of thing. So I think that that's an offer today and I'll, I can make that happen um, internally within the CCG. Um, the unpaid carers are coming under, I believe, uh, in cohort six. Um, I'm looking at Phil and I'm hoping he's going to nod from a vaccination programme. Um, there's a letter that came out uh, a week or so ago from um, national colleagues. It was the 8th of March. So, I, so GP practices do are expected to have a carers register. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, uh, you did just be confident that they do have what I mean it might not be up to date and all that and there's always people going on and coming off but you know we could do a piece of work um to find out how many have and you know they, they all should have a carers register and um, I just wanted to give a bit of uh context as well that it's not just the carers register that's being used to identify carers so well, I'm sure I know there's, a, there's a whole list because it's within the document but the particular reason I wanted to get this one because I, I have not heard of anybody yet, um, well, my my friend's family and anecdotally on social um, media, everybody I speak to is when they've rang up, they have not been, they said, oh, no, they've not, they've not been registered or, or, or they've told the person that the carers, but it has not been registered. Okay. I filled forms in and everything on my GPs and when I said to them I'm a carer they said oh are you okay and when you had to ask to them to put them onto your onto the persons that you're looking after that that doesn't go down you just put as a carer as a carer but for the vaccination you had to register to be on the persons you are looking after otherwise you weren't accepted and that okay. was difficult in, your, in itself all yeah. right family. There's probably something around, you know, us making sure that those practices are following those processes and, and training and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, that that can be picked up. So um, happy, and happy to have a conversation with the right person offline to make sure that's connected into the meetings that we have with general practice. So happy with that. But I guess I just wanted to let everyone know that it's not just the flag on the GP record. And so I'm sure this is what Phil will go into a bit more detail on. It's, it is the flag on the GP record, but it's also we uh, cross-referencing and also adding for those who are entitled to carers allowance, also those who are known to local authorities okay, and are in receipt of support following carers assessment and those known to local carers organisations. So all of those things should be brought together to get a, a comprehensive list. Now, not everybody may have been offered the vaccine yet because we're still working through cohort six. So we are very, it's very clear by national, nationally in the government, how we're supposed to work through those cohorts. But we're well on the way, so hopefully that'll get resolved. 
Um, and I'm going to hand over to Phil because he will know more detail about how that uh, list is being pulled together, if that's OK, Phil. I'm hoping you do, because I know you sit in all the groups around that. <laughs> yeah, can we coming in, Chair? Is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Phil. I do think, Valerie, that's exactly the right question, because you, you'd expect the vaccination programme to shed a lot more light on, on carers in Doncaster. So I think your question is absolutely right. Um, and um, I, I thought the presentation was great, by the way. The, the focus on the NHS was helpful, but I think actually when, when I look at the standards for general practice that you helpfully provided the link for, Geoffrey, um, they're standards that should apply to all of us, actually. So I think we all need to think about those standards and I wouldn't, as, as convenient as it might be from my perspective, to turn this into a conversation about the NHS. I think all the organisations on this call should know who their carers are, should have actively think about their carers um, and engage with them appropriately. And I think those standards are really helpful. I was going to ask a question about that in a second. In terms of the vaccination point, Valerie, Jackie's just described the Department of Work and Pensions gives some information, the council gives some information, um, and GP practices give some information. And also within the protocol, within the guidance from the government, there's, they're, they're almost acknowledging that there'll be a whole load of carers who aren't picked up by any of those three bodies um, and a process for those carers to step forward. And I guess you might say that's testimony to the experience that carers have, isn't it? Because there isn't a single place that has a clear unifying grip on supporting you as a carer and connecting you with other people. We might want to think in Doncaster, how are we going to organise that? So I don't think it's just about pointing at individual organisations. I think it's about how we wrap around our GP surgeries, our, our different community settings and say, how can we all support carers? And perhaps with GP surgeries, give them more support with identifying and supporting carers than, than maybe they currently get. So I think it's the right prompt. I do think that in terms of the existing vaccination list, um, I don't want to disappoint you too much, Valerie, but I suspect that that single list will be held somewhere in NHS England now for Doncaster. <laughs> When we try to get it, they'll tell us we can't have it because of information sharing. So I think we need to do our own work in Doncaster to get our, our own version of the truth together <coughs> and work on that. The question I was going to ask, if you don't mind, Chair, actually, just off, uh, off the back of this, is um, um, CCG Governing Body and Council Cabinet, and thank you to Kay for what she did at Council Cabinet earlier in the week, have agreed a learning disability and autism strategy now which is based on being accountable to people with lived experience. It's based on you said we did, and we now need to do some work on the priorities that you've identified and the actions that need to be there and keep holding ourselves to account to you for that. I think the question I wanted to ask carers with, with the chair's permission is, how do you want to see that for carers more broadly? How do you want to see a carer's strategy develop? How do you want us to show that we're accountable to you in Doncaster for the next steps on that? OK, thanks, Phil. OK, um, Jeffrey and Angela, do you want to answer that? Well, I think the first thing is that we need a discussion around how that could plan out. We have got the All Carers Action Group, haven't we, Angela? And we could have some discussion around that and then link it in with um, the comms team, Jackie, that you spoke about, um, because I think that it's it, we've got to acknowledge that there's been some really good practices and that some of this is just information sharing. But I do think that if I was registered for my son uh, to be his carer, but I wasn't registered as a carer. And that's where the little nitty gritty comes in. And it could be something so simple that could be developed just a way to move forward. Does, does that make sense? Phil's not in K, so and other people yeah. are, yeah. Jeffrey, did you want to add anything? But I think Kay's suggestion that, that that question goes back to the All Carers Action Group. Yes. Um, also, uh, we're asking the board today to for the commitment to your uh, charter. I think yeah. we also should be asking the primary care networks to show their commitment as well. They're not on this group, but that's something we no, can certainly pick up. Yes, we can, Jeffrey. Yeah. So sorry, I've had Kath waiting for quite some time. Sorry, Kath. No problem. Um, thanks um, for that very heartfelt um, 
presentation, Kay, and it certainly resonated with me. Um, I used to be a carer as well. So this lived experience, what, what kind of struck me is um, it, it lends itself so well to peer support and community support. So yes, as Voluntary Action Doncaster, more than happy to, to sign up to the Charter um, and to look at some way that we could facilitate potentially that peer support because you, you, your carer's journey starts and ends but when you're no longer a carer there, there's that sense of bereavement all over again yeah. so totally get that um so yeah as somebody i think putting some peer support into place at, at a community level uh, would be really helpful okay thanks Catherine. rupert's reminding me that i obviously don't know who's on the board thank you rupert so that we need that conversation with laura yeah Thanks, Rupert. OK, so next was Andrew Goodall. Thanks, Rachel. Um, my question is about emotional health and support for carers. Obviously, um, thank you to Geoffrey and Kay for their presentations. But what came through to me was the question in my mind is, are we doing enough locally to provide that emotional health and support to prevent carer breakdown and to pre prevent isolation and loneliness and to support people to continue in their unpaid carer roles? Mm. Okay, Angela's the next person up. I don't know if that's something you can answer, Angela, in terms of the contracted services that we have at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, um, I just wanted to touch back in on, on what Val said earlier around, you know, do we know more carers through the result of, of COVID? And yeah, yeah. we do um, through our kind of targeted phone calls with those who are shielding um, and, you know, there's evidence from the returns in our carer service, we actually bucked the trend nationally because we had more carers coming forward for support. And uh, I think so. that's an important thing to say. But as we're going through um, the vaccination call up as well, there is a two, there's a couple of waves to this. So um, there is around um, the uh, DWP data, carer service data and local authority data, but also there will be um, a call beyond that as well to try and reach carers who are not known as Phil said, or you know, into the system as such as we know it. So that will be a piece of work that will be taking place later on. In terms of investment um, within the carers uh, element within Doncaster, there are lots of various ways to support uh, carers groups and, and creative ways to move forward so we've um, from on a personal basis like the local assistance scheme you know we've got carers are now um, part of Ros Jones our mayor's, mayor, mayor's priorities for the mayoral spring sprint so we've got support around kind of communities groups what's offered yeah. there on a personal um, yeah. level yeah. through like the local assistance scheme yeah. and we've got some comms coming out about that very soon so there is investment around for groups to access and, and I, I was just working with a group yesterday a carers group to try and get some funding for them um, who and this group supports people who are look at the cared for of you know uh, people with mental health issues so particularly important I think we've got a lot of work to do across the system in Doncaster as we're coming out of Covid around some of the um, extreme situations carers have been in so it's really really good that we can have this partnership discussion um, to see what as Phil said earlier what can we do in our respective areas to support carers better that we're all adhering to that big best practice in all of our areas and just a quick one for Jackie I do have some information Jackie around the primary um, care so the GP practice local practices around who has a carers register who needs support with that so is that something I could share with you in the meeting yeah thank you okay thank you and we've now got Richard Parker yeah, thank you, Rachel, and thank you for the um, the really good presentation. Um, my point really is about um, the charter and the sort of request to sign up to the charter, because during the COVID pandemic, we've um, really missed, I think, carers and visitors to the hospital who help us in many, many ways with the care of the patients. Um, and I think we've seen some of the impacts on that in in a number of areas. The challenge we always have with charters, though, is that we get a number of requests to sign them. And actually, we're never sure whether it's the charter itself or whether it's what we call standard work or standard practice. 
in terms of the key questions that staff need to ask, why they need to ask them and what they do with the information, because carers themselves will have different needs and different requests and require different inputs. And if we have a charter, then sometimes staff use that charter as the only checklist or the only way of doing things. And actually we're more interested in what you do all of the time and getting the all of the time element right. So what I would suggest on behalf of DBTH is that Jeffrey and colleagues um, sit down with Director of Nursing and others and just have a look at the principles of the charter because the principles are always absolutely the right things to do. Where the system falls is that we don't do the right things right and at the right time and therefore the underneath work is probably more important than actually accepting the principles because the principles as i've said are always the right things to do but what we want is that they're applied consistently across the board okay thanks for that richard um yes so i'll come back to actions that we've agreed and and, and hopefully everybody will agree with that so i've got kay's hand back up again i've got valerie's hand still up i can't take it off <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't either, so I'll just tell. Okay, it's Richard. Oh, uh, done it. Uh, and okay, what have we got now? So I've got K. Sorry, I've got, let me just hold on a sec. I've got. Don't want to miss anybody, Jeffrey. I've got K and Jeffrey still with their hands up. Yeah, can I just um, ask everybody to be mindful that if you are a carer and this only you are who are caring. For that person in that house or in another household where nobody cares for them if anything or they had any health problems i think that needs to be something that needs to be looked into how would how would the planning for that be now i know what i've done is um ju just as a, a point is that when the social services come to do the assessment i requested that one of the shared lives uh, people that they could be contacted and my son would know that contact number I'd have it down and he could ring them and with their with their um, agreement they could come and pick Scott up or ring for the police or the ambulance or whatever I, th I think there's that element in it as well thank you okay thank you Kay yeah um got a thumbs up there from Lucy Jeffrey and I think that's the last question then we'll start summarising. I'd just like to uh, say that I understand where Richard's uh, coming from um, because what I see at Doncaster and Bassett Law is that because we've got um, Doncaster and Bassett Law then um, what, where carers seek help then falls under two different councils if you see okay. what I mean yeah yeah because you'd be pointing people to Doncaster Council and then you'd have to point them to, you know, Bassett Law. Uh, so I can see, you know, where uh, that problem may occur at the hospital. I don't know what Richard, uh, you know, thinks of that. But uh, yeah, I can understand where Richard's coming from, you know, with the, uh, the charter. Okay. Uh, I, I think I'm grateful good. that, you know, Richard, you know, has said that, you know, he wants. Uh, for us to meet uh, people in the trust. Okay, that's good. So there's an. So if I can try and summarise some of the actions we've agreed, I don't really know if we've covered all of the questions though that were asked of us. So Doncaster Carers Charter is one of the things we were all asked to sign up to. Sorry, Phil. Just wanted to come in on the charter. Um, so I think the charter is um, is for me the charter is important. The charter is asking organisations to acknowledge that carers can be an invisible group, but are also are a large enough group to demand particular focus. So I think they are carers group is too important a group to be submerged in other professional standards. That's my my opinion. Thank Obviously, you. everyone might have, have different opinions on it. Um, and I think that um, all of us have a responsibility around carers. And actually, as, as has been set out, actually, a lot of our employees are carers. So mm -hmm. the act of signing up to the charter is also the act of supporting one's employees with their caring responsibilities. So, so personally, I, I you know, I 
fully support the charter. I don't think it's just I, I commit as an organisation to refer any carer to the council. I think it's I commit as an organisation to do my to play my own part in supporting carers, which includes connecting carers to the, to support from other organisations if they need it. OK, thanks, Phil. So where where are we now with the carers charter? Not from this meeting, but physically, is it there? Ange, do you want to answer that? What are the next steps? Have we got some people signed up and not others? Yeah, Rachel, so we do have um, some partners signed up already, but okay. we'd really like to develop that wider and, and really have everyone within this call um, sign up to that, really. I, I just want to say, you know, over 100 carers in Doncaster were part of that developing that charter. It's important to them. There's a lot of carer voices there and actually 11, 11 carers actually designed it. So I just think, you know, we've got a real opportunity here to do the right thing for carers in our respective areas. This is in place. It's come from Doncaster carers themselves. I think, you know, there's no stronger voice than that. And the least we can do is actually you know, sign up to that as a as a, as a kind of for, with all our organisations in respective areas. OK, so next steps then, how are we going to get that everybody signed up to that? Because to me, it doesn't sound as though it needs a year to do it. it. We're talking weeks. Rachel, I think from the trust perspective, the issue is never the principles in the charter. The issue is the standard work and what we do with it, because what people really want to know is, are the principles going to work in terms of changing something for the individual? And so, you know, from Phil's point of view, we get a significant number of requests to sign up to charters and different charters. And what we need to do is make sure that they're actually um, aligned and that the principles of them are not divergent in any way, shape or form. And that when we ask the staff, um, that actually they know what to do in terms of standard work when they come across a situation or a challenge. So my sort of suggestion from the EBTH's perspective is that the, the team, the people presenting today, sit down with the Director of Nursing and others and make sure that we can live up to the expectations of the Charter. And if we are there in terms of that, both in terms of sentiment, principle and actions, then, then the next step is very simple and straightforward and obvious. Um, because we can do that consistently for all of the patients we serve, wherever the geography is, whether that be Doncaster or Bassett Law, because what we sign up to in Doncaster, if the principles and the actions are right, would also apply to Bassett Law or would apply to Mexpro in terms of our three main sites. So happy for the team to sit down with Director of Nursing and others, because a lot of this thing goes through the nursing uh, teams to make sure that we get it right. OK, thanks, Richard. So I'm thinking there may be other Can organisations. Can I just ask a question, please, as a carer? Yeah. I mean, as a carer, I, I, I am really upset of your resistance to this charter. Um, I've, I've seen some really good charters accepted by hundreds and hundreds of acute trusts, and I really do not understand your resistance. And when you talk about principles, and I'm here sat as a carer, who's gone into your hospital many, many times, and I've had relatives of mine go to your hospital many, many times, and I've been completely blanked, been invisible, and been treated in a not a very nice way. I cannot believe what is coming out of your mouth, and I'm not being insulting in this way. And to be addressed in such a way, I'm just so flabbergasted. When I, heard, I, when I heard Phil, and it's only the very basic things I want to be recognised, identified, listened to and accepted. And I can't understand why you can't just put that down in writing as a charter. I OK, know. thanks for well, that, Valerie. I'm going to so suggest... Sorry, I do Rachel, need to can I just respond really? Because okay. I'm really sorry if you think I'm not signing up to the principles. That's not the intention of my comments. The intention of my comments is to get things right so that actually any of those issues that you've just highlighted aren't issues in the future and that when we do those things we do them as, as what we would describe I would describe as standard work so that actually the expectation of the staff and when you come across that and the thing you feel in practice and that affects you doesn't leave you with those sense um, the sense of um, not actually receiving the care or the support that you you need 
um, director of nursing is the right person to sort of sit down and do that. So we actually get it right because I think I've said a couple of times that the principles in the charter are absolutely sound and they're right and and you couldn't in essence set, sign up to that that's where we want to be. The key bit for me is making sure we are there and that actually the sense that you've just explained to us is not a sense that you have in the future. OK, I, I do need to move us on because I do need to think we need to come out with actions from here. <clears throat> so proposing actions in terms of the carers charter that there's that initial meeting with the hospital, but I'm looking to Ange now to think there may be other partners around the table that equally need that more detailed discussion. Um, so perhaps that could be arranged. I mean, police colleagues are on, St Ledger aren't here. They've got such an important link in terms of carers. So perhaps that initial meeting in the next couple of weeks to look at the principles and what it means for my organisation and then a following meeting to agree that we're all going to sign up. Does that make sense? Because I really don't think this takes long. Everybody's nodding lovely. So that's the check, the carers charter. The other thing that came out was around this list that we now have. Phil, I totally agree in terms of if we asked NHS England for it, they might say no. But I would imagine there's something locally we can do about owning that list and using it. And that would obviously clearly help with identifying carers. Is that one action that can be taken, Phil? It could. I mean, it's the right action to take, Chair. I think that the, what it what it isn't, though, I don't, I don't want to raise expectations with it because it's not an instantaneous action. No. So I think with in partnership in different Doncaster neighbourhoods, we should be saying, how do we, with carer's permission, share information that we've got, come up with a single version of the truth in relation to, to carers and make sure that we all wrap around to provide the right support that carers need. I think that that should be the intention. Um, it just won't be instantaneous. And again, I suppose the reason I asked carers representatives how they wanted to take yeah. it forward is that we need to be accountable to them in that happening. I'm guessing that they would agree with that, but there may well be other objectives they want from us as well in the context of a, a, a revised carers strategy. OK, thanks, Phil. So the All Carers Action Group, Kay, is that, is that, have, they got, have you got another meeting arranged soon? Um, we've got one on the 16th, I, I believe, isn't it? And yes, oh. yeah, it is key, you're right, yeah. 16th. So that, that can, if that could be the focus of the discussion and then feedback about how you want to be, to hold us all to account, I think that would be really useful. Mm. Um, thinking about the other thing that came out, which I think Andrew raised, was support and Kath raised it, peer support. Uh, is there an issue about understanding what's out there? to make sure that it is the support that carers need. And that again, not putting all the work on the carers action group, but perhaps Geoffrey, it's something for the carers oversight group because they might have that information already. I know I'm the co-chair as well, Geoffrey, but I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> Phil. Just, I mean, Angela might want to come in on a similar thing, but the, the, the council also has um, arrangements with carers organisations. And yeah. this whole idea of carers assessments, which I'm guessing um, carers won't always find to be satisfactory, both in terms of getting access to carers assessments and them having decent outcomes. And I think that's where Richard's point is important, by the way, about following through on what we what we do. So I think there's some work that um, that we're planning to do in the council alongside carers to think about how we provide better access to carers assessments in the context of better peer support from people who know carers well rather than people maybe who aren't as, as attuned to carers needs as, as, as they might be so that's part of what we want to look at over the next um, in terms of looking at contracts when they expire what we can replace them with so I think we'd want to do that alongside carers to make sure we were getting that right Okay, so may, may I come in? Sorry, I just want to say we've got a, a carer's landing page being developed through comms now to help us bundle all our information together to make it more accessible for carers who are online. Obviously, I know that doesn't include all carers, not all are online, but just to help us, you know, simplify um, where our, where all of our information's held. So I just, I just wanted to kind of get that in there. Sorry. OK, does that link to what Jackie said? It's not just the council, it links across all partner organisations. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so if there's any information that you would like to be linked, uh, you know, through 
through this board and the respective organisations, happy to, you know, cite that within this landing page as well. So it's a good shout out and call out for that to happen. So please email me with any information that you might like to be featured on there. OK, I'm just also thinking the other way around, Ange, because we need to make sure that wherever carers try and access somebody or the system, they get the same information. So, for instance, people might go to darts. Is there something that we put on the darts? Lucy's not in the darts the darts website or whatever because I think that's always been the problem for carers that yes they the carers do get a good service but it depends on who they contact first and that, I, that obviously frustrates a lot of carers. I absolutely agree and I think it would be really good to get that commitment within across the board here as well that we will share each other's information across all of our respective websites just to make sure that that's like the glue that runs through all of it so I think that's a really good point. I just wanted to say quickly um, on the back of what Phil was saying we are looking to have a different approach around carers needs assessments to help bring lower the threshold and to engage carers who are not as keen to have social workers or assessment officers engaging with them around their carer role so it's just to make it a little bit more accessible for all carers sorry i just have to get that one in okay are there any other actions jeffrey and Kay, that you wanted us to do that you don't think we've addressed no no oh, we've covered them Yes. Thank you. Okay. What I would say to people is that there is, in the, at the moment in Doncaster, there is uh, opportunities for carers, as Kay said, the All Carers Action uh, Action Group. But there's the Carers Oversight Group, and I know from probably they're not the last one because I wasn't there, but previous ones, Jeffrey, we have struggled sometimes to get people to attend from organisations yes. around the table and also to be fair the right level of person coming who has that level of involvement and awareness of what their organisations doing to carers so perhaps that's just an action that Ange and Jeffrey could look at in terms of making sure, I'm good at giving actions out um, in terms of um, making sure we have the right representation at yeah. every meeting. Because we'd Absolutely. like uh, DBTH to continue uh, uh, Stacey Knott, uh, Deputy Director of Nursing, to still, uh, you know, attend uh, the Carers GDC Oversight Group on a regular basis of the meetings. Okay. Yeah, that's so not a problem, Geoffrey. And um, and as I said, that's the right thing for us to do in terms of support. Okay. Thank thanks you. ever so much. Unless anybody's got anything else, I'm aware that we've got a lot of other items on the agenda. I've managed to do something to my screen and completely lost my notes. <laughs> I don't know what the time is or what anything's going on. But anyway, so I'd finish that item by saying thank you to Jeffrey, thank you to Kay, and thank you to Valerie for coming along. I know these meetings aren't easy, but I hope you feel that you've been listened to and that you can see what the next steps are. Yes, I'm getting some notes. So thank you very yeah. much. And and we want to hear from back from you about how we need to be held accountable to carers. Okay. And until we get to that point, then yeah. we haven't achieved it. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. right. I'm going to try and do some whizzy IT now and work out how on earth. Please stay. You can stay to the whole meeting if you'd like to. So we're now going to move on to the next item, which is uh no, it's not there so rupert can you help me what the next item is please sorry i'm gonna have to come out and go back in again yeah it's the doncaster safeguarding adult board annual report okay so we've got ben presenting this and angelique i think angelique's doing this one yes okay yes um Lovely. So welcome. Do you just want to say who you are, Angelique? And because yeah. you weren't here at the beginning. Yes, thank you thank for having you. having thank you for Thanks. having us here today. Um, my name's Angelique Chopping. I'm the Safeguarding Adults Board Manager. And I've also um brought along my colleague, um Shabnam, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Um, yes, morning everybody. Um my name is Kavnam Amin. I'm the um, my role at the moment is safeguarding adults learning and development manager, um, and I'm here just because the period that the annual report's talking about. Um, I was conscious to do the manager role, so that's why Andrew's invited me along as well. 
All right then. So, um, so basically, um, both myself and Shabnam might be able to uh, support any questions that might uh, revolve uh, from evolve from the annual report presentation. So, um, I'd just like to say that um, this annual report covers the period um, 2019-20, which is. Uh, prior or just on the tail end of COVID coming in. So it feels like a very different period to where we are at the moment. Um, and also um, this period was also chaired by an independent chair, John Woodhouse, um, who's since left us. Um, and we'll come on to that uh, at the end of uh, the video in our next steps as well. So if I may, um, present the, the video report to you if I go on and share the screen. Is that all right, Rachel? Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. OK. Well, I'll use uh, this technology. Oh, one minute. I'll... One minute, I need to click the button to share the sound. Apologies, I just need to click the button to share the sound. So I want to do that again. Oh, don't worry, we all do that. Yeah. <laughs> right, so we're on the sound. Right. Can people see the video screen? Oh, yeah, we can. Thank you. Yes, fan you. fantastic. Right, I'm going to press play. Different partners there we go. Contribute to making vulnerable adults safe able to work together where it's effective and for the best interests of those people that we all serve. Um, one of the things that is close to my heart is a concept called making safeguarding personal. And what this is about is ensuring that vulnerable adults who have suffered harm, abuse and neglect uh, are in a position to influence how, how that, that those problems are resolved. Because we recognise that even people who perhaps don't have um, a, a, a entire uh, competence, uh, do have quite strong views about what happens to them. And actually, we should always suspect these. And only if the adult was perhaps things that make them very unsafe, should we not always take into account their views. So this year, we've done probably a bit better with making safeguarding personal. Um, it's a hard thing to measure because um, it is hard to, to see how much you have actually addressed the safeguarding issue and the person's wishes at the same time. But what we can see is what feedback we get. It's something we're getting better at doing in terms of doing to 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 everyone, with everyone that we work with, and also in terms of getting the sorts of outcome that they say they'd like at the beginning. So this is something which I think is pleasing still got a long way to go and I think we always will have a long way to go but it's absolutely crucial to the ethics of uh, adult safeguarding service. So I was, I was asked um, to help with the transition of what was uh, previously the Children's Safeguarding Board to the new arrangements that were um, described in what's called Working Together 2018. And one of the things that we realised quite early on was that there was a lot of duplication between what happened on the adult safeguarding board side and the children's safeguarding partnership, which is what it's called now side. Um, partly tried to be efficient to ensure that people's time were, was used well, but also partly to see if we could start to iron out some of the problems about the interface between uh, children safeguarding, adult safeguarding, we have uh, pushed the systems quite a lot close together. Uh, in particular, whilst we have um, two, in theory, two different meetings, but one part of both meetings is shared. Uh, we also have some shared subgroup work, and this is uh, a way we hope of more integrating the way the children's adults boards work uh, in terms of efficiency, but also in terms of effectiveness, especially for people who are affected by that transition. The thing which uh, I'm most surprised by, and I think pleased, it does seem to me at the moment we're going well, is that quite a lot of the work we do in the in this setting of when we meet in the board 
actually goes into what we call the joint board session, which is actually technically uh, both uh, a session of the Adult Safeguarding Board and a Children's Safeguarding Partnership Group. Uh, and it is really interesting how many of the issues that adults and children's safeguarding face are actually quite similar and related and how we can start to think about addressing them as a single approach rather than two different approaches. So one of the things which I'm pleased with is that uh, broadly the way that we assess risk in services in Doncaster across children's adults um, has become much more consistent, modelled really on a children's approach, but it works pretty well for adults. Practitioner form was an invention of my predecessor, who was the uh, chair of the Children's Safeguarding Board. Uh, and he wanted a, a forum where he could talk to people who actually did hands-on frontline safeguarding, just to test out that what he thought was happening was happening. Uh, I inherited that, so I have to say, um, when it was just children's, it was fantastically useful. But in the spirit of stealing good ideas from one another, We've made it into a both children's and adults uh, frontline practitioner forum. And it is extremely valuable. It's extremely valuable for several different reasons. The first is that we can test out whether the things that we think are happening at a at the board level, which is a long way from the, you know, the heart, heart the, the cold face, the, the difficult end of safeguarding, are actually the things that are happening. And most of they are, but we always get a a nuanced understanding of the issues by talking to practitioners. But the other thing we can do with the practitioners is, is talk through them things like new learning from um, incidents uh, or reviews or uh, new guidance um, about how to make it relevant to them. So that when we say, this is something we think you need to consider when you are developing the way you practice, it's delivered in a way that they can understand uh, and use immediately rather than having to think about too much because they've already told us what they need rather than us telling them what, what we think they, they should have. Uh, I think there's, there's two, in, ter in terms of key achievements, there's, there's, there's two different sorts of achievement. So in terms of um, um, ongoing achievement, I think we are seeing signs that the efforts we make to continuously improve to make the system safer, more effective and actually better for the service users uh, are continuing to show that we are just steadily improving. And that's what we must do. We must continue to improve all the time. I think in terms of specific uh, learning or uh, instance, um, we learned a great deal from a, a very unfortunate incident where a young man died. Um, he, he, he lived in a hospital setting and um, his death was very sad uh, and uh, at first we didn't quite know um, what there was that we might learn from it but actually we spent some time looking at the circumstances surrounding this young man's death and we actually learned a great deal uh, both in terms of the institutional setting in which he lived and uh, working with them uh, we made it a lot safer they made it a lot safer together it's a lot safer but also we've learned a lot about the sorts of risks that you have in certain institutional settings when there's all sorts of different things that drive um, more or less safe practice uh, and that's something that we'll be using in lots of other places and using and it's also learning we've shared with colleagues outside Doncaster and also colleagues who work in children's services because actually the issues aren't exactly the same but there's some very similar ones Hello, my name is Chair of the Keeping Safe subgroup, which is a subgroup of the Safeguarding Adults and Children's Boards in Doncaster. So the Keeping Safe subgroup is a, a, an important subgroup because it's about listening to people's experiences of safeguarding, making sure we listen to how they can advise us on what needs to be better about safeguarding and how we can provide better information to keep people safe. So the group um, comprises of lots of people from across the different organisations in Doncaster, so from the hospitals, the mental health trust, the local authority, and 
We also work really closely with the Keeping Safe Forum. The Keeping Safe Forum is a group of, of people from the community who've got an interest in keeping people safe and advise us and provide challenge and we provide information to them about lots of different uh, services and support options to keep people safe. So the work of the Keeping Safe Forum uh, looks at campaign materials around keeping people safe. We support the annual Keeping Safe event, which is about ensuring people's voices can be heard. And we share information and engage people in different activities, to help develop and design new materials to uh, get information out to people in an informative and engaging way. So the Keeping Safe subgroup is really there to make sure that we are listening to people, that we're keeping it real, and we're making sure that people's needs are met um, around safeguarding and that information is there so that people know when they see something, they've got to say something, and they know how to raise raise alerts or, or to raise uh, concerns about safeguarding or instance, the instances they see. For me, the Keeping Safe Forum is a really good way to get uh, providers and members of the general community involved and talking about what it means to keep each other safe. I think what's been really effective is kind of removing the overarching term of safeguarding, which makes things sound a bit corporate and a bit, oh, it's not really for me. Whereas a Keeping Safe Forum sounds much more inclusive uh, it's much more accessible to the general community, especially people who have got vulnerabilities, because I think they're the people that need to feel included in, in something like the forum. And um, what I like about it is that the different speakers and things like that that you get in and the different themes at the meetings, they can actually make you think about things in a different way, that actually these might not have come onto my radar as something about safeguarding, but it is about keeping safe. So there's been loads of really useful resources that I've gained from, from the forum uh, in various organisations I've worked for. So um, when Carmel from Changing Lives came and did the fire safety talk quite a while back, she then came to our organisation and delivered that talk to 17 to 20 of our, vul our vulnerable tenants. And it was about thinking about things in a different way and making things really simplistic that's actually really relevant to everyone's life. Um, we also had really positive feedback um, from things like the sexual health nurse who came and thinking about different ways that you can keep yourself safe that are kind of outside the box. So scam awareness that was, was there. I then went on to become a scam ambassador through hearing about that through the Keeping Safe Forum. So I've been able to share that information with loads of other organisations. So that's, that's what I feel is really good about it. Right, thank you very much. Um, are we all back? Yep. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much for, for watching that video. Um, myself and Shabnam are here to take any questions that you might have regarding that. Um, if also I could just let you know around the board sort of next steps moving forward as well. Um, we we're on the cusp of change really we've um john woodhouse uh, left doncaster in november and we now have a new independent chair that chairs both the children's and adults uh, board and partnership uh, we're also looking to revise our strategic plan um, and also the work plans that sit underneath there um, and we're also looking to undertake a stock take of the board's and uh, children's and adults arrangements because um, as we uh, alluded to in that video, um, there was a lot of change during that period. So it's time now to, for us to reflect and gain any feedback from the partnership on how that is working for everybody uh, and to see how we can improve it um, moving forward. And also to continue to strengthen the voice of of the person throughout the safeguarding response as well. So just some um, next step, 
details on our thoughts on next steps really moving forward. So are there any questions from anybody around uh, the annual report? Okay. Lucy, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so this is one of the questions from our Health and Social Care Forum members, which I'm passing on. Um, they've said only 59% of people said that they felt safer after a safeguarding intervention. Um, which seemed low, but how does that compare with other local authorities? Is actually that quite quite reasonable? Or um, In terms of benchmarking, um, I'm not sure that um, all other agencies uh, collect that information. So it would have to be something we'd, we'd, we'd go off and, and ask around uh, the other mm -hmm. um, boards. And we could do that through our Yorkshire and Humber regional um, uh, networks as well. So mm. in uh, there are quite a lot of considerations in terms of gathering feedback from people who've been through the safeguarding response because um, obviously sometimes people are unable to give their response because uh, mm. they may lack capacity or they might be in a, a um, unwell at that time where at the end of the safeguarding um, so there are quite a few barriers to sort of gaining that feedback but wherever we can we do um, try mm -hmm. to ask and gain that um, so I would have to do I'd have to do a little bit of homework and come back to you Lucy if yeah. that's all right yeah, that would uh, be but I, yeah, yeah but I can take your name and I'll get your contact details uh, and I'll, I will come back to you thank you all. very much indeed thank you Thank you. Uh, I've got Phil. Yeah, I think I just got to pick up on Lucy's sure. question. I think it's a really good question and quite, the, yeah. the benchmarking stuff is fine. It's good, good if we do that. But um, I suppose what we'd all think sitting here is if um, four out of 10 Doncaster people don't feel safer as a result of safeguarding, that um, doesn't really matter whether everyone else is different from that or roughly the same as that. We'd want to be better for Doncaster. So one, one of the things, um, Angie, maybe we can pick up on is for that four out of ten, maybe we can just do a bit of a look into why why they don't feel safer, what 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 that means about what we could do better, um, and some things it may be impossible for us to sort in terms of particular intractable issues, but there'll probably be some things we could do, and that and that helps us with our kind of improvement plan then. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's a good action. Yeah. Thank you. Any? I can't see any other hands up. No, so thank you ever so much for the presentation. It was nice to have a video because um, uh, I think it can really focus the issues. Really good to see about the Keeping Safe Forum as well. And I thought one of your presenters there who said just the change of a name makes all the difference around engagement. And that's probably a lesson for all the work that we're doing across health and wellbeing. So I followed Rupert's instructions and I switched on and off. And so I've now got my notes back. Um, so what we are asked to do is note the multi-agency activity undertaken during 2019-20 by the Doncaster Safeguarding Adults Board to safeguard adults at risk and prevent abuse from occurring wherever possible. And obviously, in addition, we've now got that action to understand more about that 59%. OK. Are people happy to note that and those action, that additional action? Yeah. OK, thank you very much, Shabnam and Angelique. Thank you. um, you're welcome thank to you. stay, um, but equally, if you, you, you want to go, that's absolutely fine as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So on to item 10, which is Ben going to present that, um, and he's going to present the Doncaster Safeguarding Children's Partnership Annual Report, um, and he's going to summarise the key points. Thank you, Ben. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Um, uh, much of, well, in terms of the joint working between the Adult and Children Board, uh, a lot of that was said in John Woodhouse's uh, opening presentation, so I'll try not to repeat that too much, but that is contained within our annual report as well. Um, the annual report does cover the same period, so it's just um, pre-COVID, really, um, covers up to March 2020. Um, the foreword has been written by our new chair, John Goldup, and uh, obviously he didn't cover uh, that period, but he's he's mentioned uh, how different the report will be. Uh, I think, as Angelique said, it, it almost feels like a different era. So um, 
similarly to the the adult board, uh, we've had a bit of a delay in producing it because of the pressures um, that COVID has created. Uh, reference was made by John as well around the DSCP, so that's Doncaster Safeguard and Children Partnership and the DSAB, Doncaster Safeguard and Adults Board, having a joint strategic plan on the page. So that obviously applies to us as well. And moving forward, the intention would be that we have a joint uh, report because although um, we, we haven't achieved that as yet, we have achieved a lot as a business unit working together jointly over the last two years and work very closely together. And as has been suggested, there are many crossovers between the work. I mean, there are still separate things as well, but uh, there are many crossovers between the work of the adult board and the children's board. And that's reflected in the fact that we have a joint board as well as the two separate boards as well. So just to update people who may not be familiar, apologise if you, you know this already, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are people who don't. Legislative changes, 2017 Children Act mean local safeguard and uh, children arrangements are now the responsibility of three statutory safeguarding partners in terms of the legislation. In Doncaster, that's slightly different because we have the Children Services Trust as well, so it's technically four. Uh, so the partners are Doncaster Council, Clinical Commissioning Group, South Yorkshire Police, and as I've already said, uh, many of those uh, safeguarding functions are delegated to the Children's Services Trust. Board meets quarterly um, and that consists of the three meetings that we've already already talked about. Um, some of the things, pressures in Doncaster, demand for children's services is higher than the national average, referral rates to children's social care are higher and um, just a personal reflection I suppose, I, I joined Doncaster back in 2009 after the um, six serious case reviews, and that had unfortunately created a climate of very much of risk adversity and a culture of very much referring everything in um, to, to, to the front door. And I think that's something over the years that has, um, it, it, the legacy of that is, is that it's something that um, we are continuing to address, but um, it, it will take a period of time. And, um, Coupled with that is the fact that Doncaster, uh, I think we're the um, in in I think we're 40th currently in terms of deprivation across the country out of over 200 boroughs. Uh, report commissioned by the Children and Families Executive Board concluded that in Doncaster, almost one child in three lives in poverty. So that is it in terms of uh, demands. It's inevitable that there will be significant demands both at an early help and a statutory uh, child protection level. In spite of that, there have been a lot of uh, very significant achievements. Uh, one of the most successful aspects of the multi-agency learning uh, was around the audits that were undertaken around exploitation, mental health, sexual abuse and domestic abuse. Um, this was again back in the times before we were working virtually, but we were man managed to get together uh, really strong groups of uh, 20 to 30 multi-agency practitioners and uh, carried out some really thorough and rigorous audits which are available on our website and um, I, th I think that's been some really positive learning and hopefully we will uh, be reintroducing those in the future. Um, overall progress has been made in implementing the new arrangements. Uh, feedback has generally been very positive. Uh, members of, of both boards consider the re revised joint format to be more effective than previously. And I think the important thing moving forward is to make sure that we understand fully what's joint business and what's um, business purely for, for, for either the children's or the adults board. So we're going to, as Angelique uh, referred to, a kind of process of next steps in terms of with uh, John Gold up the new chair, trying to se separate out and make sure that we're as efficient as, as, efficient as we can be around all of those. Very positive news around the early help strategy um, that provides prevention and early intervention when a need is identified, referrals made for early help um, a slight, are up from the previous year. Focus on practice development has improved outcomes for families, evidencing the overall closure outcome. Uh, outcomes most notably plans completed has improved. Family dis disengagement has de de decreased and step up to social care has, has fallen. So for people not, again, not that familiar with the early help strategy, 
they are they are really key challenges, particularly around family disengagement, because one of the biggest um, challenges around early help, it's not statutory. Um, so it, we're very much relying on the cooperation of families to engage with that. They can easily just basically close the door and say, we don't want that service. So to actually increase, uh, decrease disengagement is a big um, a, a big achievement. And around step up to social care, uh, again, because of kind of a national climate of risk adversity, there's a real challenge to make sure that um, things don't unnecessarily escalate up to social care and, and we've improved in that respect. So that's that's very promising. Uh, regarding child protection plans, again, this is a reflection of trying to challenge some of the risk, risk adversity. Trend is a steady decline over recent years and there are no child protection plans that have been in place for two years or longer suggest that effective early intervention is preventing problems from escalating to a point where child protection procedures are, are required. And again, not to understate that, that is an incredible achievement because uh, the system, national reports were showing that the system was very much overheating in the wake of um, baby Peter and so on. So it's been, been continuing escalation uh, for quite some years. Other, other achievements, the Safeguard and Children's Partnership has continued to develop the neglect strategy aiming to ensure early recognition of neglect and improved responses to it by all agencies. And I can update you on the current picture. We are um, buying some external training in and developing a pool around the NSPCC's uh, graded care profile, which has proven to be very effective. So we're looking forward to that in the future, in the near future. Um, in response to two lessons learned reviews, uh, which tragically involved um, young people taking their own lives, we've developed a suicide contagion protocol in conjunction with public health. And again, tragically, we've had further um, children taking their own lives. But what's been very positive uh, out, out of such a tragedy is the su suicide contagion protocol has been implemented and very much appears to have prevented things escalating where other young people begin to self-harm or, or take their own lives. So the feedback from that has been very positive. Uh, partnership strong commitment to multi-agency training and continues to work with our established multi-agency training pool. So obviously this was reflecting when we were st still doing things face to face. Uh, but just to update you on that, we have now started delivering, delivering virtual training, which has again been well received, but we are um, intending as we move out of lock lockdown not to um, completely remove uh, virtual training but actually have a blended approach because some of the feedback is it's more time efficient it's more it, the, the virtual training is easier to access for people there aren't some, we can offer a much bigger capacity so the intention is to combine um, both really and um, cover both adult and children's uh, safeguarding issues in one universal training calendar so again that should be a very positive development um, our last face-to-face -face conference was down at the Keep Moats uh, back in uh, February of 2020. Uh, 180 professionals attended. Um, that followed on from the nine pre previous conferences that we've had. And uh, at, that was actually our first joint adults and children's around exploitation. It was described variously as inspiring, informative, excellent and powerful. So that was very positive. Uh, the child death overview panel, um, significant processes, progress has been made in meeting the requirements of working together 2018. So that required us to have a bigger uh, footprint and closer collaborative working footprint in terms of the uh, numbers of cases reviewed. And this has meant uh, working more closely with the other South Yorkshire areas. And um, this has led to uh, a quarterly shared learning forum as well as having their own individual uh, CDOP meetings. So that's uh, the Child Death Overview Panel reviews all the cases of child death in Doncaster, so not just those that were um, resulting from abuse or neglect, which fortunately are, are generally reasonably rare. It also um, reviews uh, neonatal deaths, for example, children killed in accidents, um, and, and so on, all the various causes. So um, that's progress in that respect. 
uh, we have a quality and performance group exploring the use of data. Um, we've made some quite good progress around there because we re revised the um, framework in this respect and uh, we've linked the audits that I mentioned previously around the JTI framework so that's helped us prepare for that potential inspection as well and it's put the partnership in a better um, position to understand and anal analyse the function of the whole system. Uh, John's already mentioned the practitioner forum uh, that continues to go from strength to strength and one of the things we've found uh, around doing it virtually is uh, we've now got up to upwards of around 40 people, 40 multi-agency practitioners attending from both adults and children services, whereas when we were doing it face to face, uh, numbers were significantly lower. So uh, we will have to work out the best blend moving forward in that respect. That's not to say there aren't uh, significant challenges moving forward. And obviously uh, the impacts of COVID has been um, very significant in terms of an increase in referrals, increase in uh, volume of domestic abuse, for example, and severity of domestic abuse. So clearly that's put the system under uh, a, a great amount of strain. But in terms of um, future developments for the, for the Children's Board itself, we have invested in a new website, um, which we uh, will be continuing to develop when that when that's able to move higher up the priority list. And uh, the universal training calendar, my colleague Shabnam is uh, doing some significant work putting that together. And um, what we do um, want to do, achieve in terms of um, the keeping safe uh, group that Andrew Goodall uh, mentioned previously, um, is more systematically capture the voice of the child. And although there's some very good work going on with individual agencies, um, we do need to develop that uh, more uh, significantly on a multi-agency basis. So um, in terms of since uh, the period the, the report covers, unfortunately, we have had more um, a, a greater incidence of um, rapid reviews and children's safeguarding practice reviews but during the period um, that the report covers um, we only had one right at the end of that period. So key priorities for 2021 still being developed at the, mo in, at the moment but multi-agency response to the ongoing Covid pandemic, um, improved integration with a safer stronger Doncaster partnership so that covers the issues around domestic abuse and all other uh, violence in the community and um, also to have better uh, links with, with, with this board here in terms of uh, the impacts of mental health issues on young people's uh, well-being. Okay so that's hopefully that's bit giving you a reasonable summary of the report and obviously I'm happy to take any questions that people would like to ask. Okay. okay. Oh, thanks, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Anybody got any questions? No. Any comments from Rihanna that you want to, you feel you need to make, Rihanna? Uh, it's just because I switched my screen on, isn't it, Rachel? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, no, thank you very much. So as being set out, this is a period before, before actually our really COVID response. Um, it is our intent to produce a report much sooner. Um, so that is actually quite very much relevant and current for us. So that will be the intention of the work of the business unit um, in conjunction with called John Gold as the new chair. Um, of course, the recent year has presented us with many, many challenges which will be reflected in our next report. Um, but I look forward to the joint safeguarding arrangements to be strengthened in this coming year um, through the two boards coming together better. Thank you. OK, thanks, Rihanna. If nobody's got any questions, thank you ever so much, Ben. Really comprehensive presentation. Um, and obviously highlighted successes, but equally the, the issues that need to be addressed. And I think uh, you mentioned about linking more with mental health and hopefully that's something that's already in progress because uh, I think we all see in the press about
the impact that COVID has had on children and young people. Okay, thank you ever so much, Ben. Oh, you're on mute, Ben. Ben, you're on mute. I missed all of that. Sorry, I don't know how I managed to do that. I didn't realise I'd done that. Sorry, um, no, I was just going to say in terms of the LLRs, the Lessons Learned Review for the first two uh, suicides, uh, it what did feel that the kind of support wasn't as joined up as it could have been, but certainly with the other ones, with the suicide contagion protocol, the feedback's been really positive. So that, that work is well underway now. OK, thanks very much. If there's no other questions, no. Thank you again. And we'll move on to item 11, which is Rupert's uh, Director of Public Health report. Thanks, Rupert. Thanks. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Just having some trouble getting off mute for some reason. So, uh, Right, so um, this is the 2020 uh, Director of Public Health uh, annual report and uh, no delay because of the pandemic, Rachel. So uh, people may know that uh, I have to write an annual report and the council has to publish it. So this report went to full council in uh, January. Uh, what I did uh, this year is to divide the report really into three sections. So one is to provide a, a reflection on 2020 and 2020 was the sort of the year of COVID for many of us, but was obviously sort of bookended by the flooding in Doncaster in uh, November. But also people may remember the Hatfield Moor fire uh, that we had and other incidents. So although COVID um, you know, did sort of dominate our thinking. There were other things that we had to contend with uh, uh, during the year. Uh, so there's a section on COVID. Uh, there's then a section looking at uh, how the, uh, the headline health indicators for Doncaster compare uh, and also then how we deploy the public health grant. And this year I've also included the additional COVID monies that have come into the local authority and then a a section on the performance of um, um, uh, the Public Health uh, Commission services. And then finally, uh, there's a third section, which is the call to action for next year. Uh, I won't embarrass anybody by asking them what last year's call to action uh, was. Uh, but if you're if you're thinking uh, it was tobacco, if you remember, uh, we did a focus uh, uh, on. So uh, I think uh, the way I described the first section is there's obviously a lot, there will be a lot of uh, lessons learned, uh, reviews going on into COVID, um, 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 investigations, inquiries, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, one of the things that's, um, you know, clear to me is that nothing stays um, the same and nothing stays still. So, uh, you know, there's lots of changes, as you mentioned in your initial um statement Rachel in terms of how the NHS is working and is you know organizing there's changes to the way public health England um are organized uh, and that will happen over the course of the year too so I did think it was useful to do some uh, sort of reflections really and I suppose the key reflection was you know the the way that uh, local people local community groups local organizations have pulled together to really sort of manage through this pandemic is phenomenal and you know uh, you know sometimes we we feel it seems like we're surprised when our, our communities uh, pull together but uh, they always uh, have done and i think they always will but sometimes it, we need to recognise that more, maybe in some of the sort of positions that we we hold. And alongside that, I suppose, Rachel, was the uh, the key role that uh, you know the, the key workers were playing uh, during the the pandemic. So health workers, care workers, but actually the you know the large percentage of the Doncaster workforce that uh, can't work from home and uh, have still been uh, going out to work to uh, keep sort of you know key major infrastructure running you know and that includes you know police colleagues fire colleagues ambulance colleagues too so uh, we shouldn't um, forget that uh, and also picked up on a number of things that we've talked about here you know not just the direct impacts of the virus but the impacts of the lockdown 
and then just thinking about as we sort of move into uh, recovery and I am hopeful that we will see more sort of recovery this year is we will need to keep um, thinking and preparing and planning for the next pandemic so uh, that's one thing that we can be certain of there will be another one uh, but it probably won't be like this one um, that that's usually what happens with um, these sorts of things but also about how closely the uh, health and the economy are interlinked and as we recover we've really got to uh, invest in that so so that's my perspective on covid i think the perspective around health overall the finance and the performance is that you know, over the last 10 years, you know, despite um, the sort of, you know, context we've been working in, we've still not been able to really close the gap in terms of inequalities. And, you know, I think this is an opportunity for us to rethink our approach. I know um, that NHS colleagues, as the um, our integrated care systems are forming, you know, inequalities, um, population health management are going to be really at the centre of of those um, uh, approaches and we are going to have to sort of look and think about what more we might do and what might we need to do differently and it may be that more of the same is no longer uh, the way to go uh, and then finally I, I suppose I, in the call to action um, I've sort of given some thought and uh, together with the policy insight and change team in the council in terms of what our sort of challenges are and we've definitely got a challenge uh, around the health and uh, you know a healthy and compassionate borough uh, we've obviously talked this morning about how we can have a safer and more resilient borough uh, and also we touched on skills and uh, creativity uh, earlier and together with how we how that economy sort of delivers uh, but we've got to do that in a way that doesn't um, sort of degrade our planet any further so you know we can't um, we, we can't forget the, the climate emergency and uh, flooding in Doncaster tells me we're on the front line of the climate emergency it's happening in our places now but we've also got to do all those things in a way that doesn't leave anybody uh, behind so in the report you'll see this sort of emergence of a sort of diagram um, some people have, have called it a bit of a donut so how do we uh, support everyone to uh, thrive but within the limits of the, the sort of the planetary boundaries and uh, I think that's a framing that uh, we should be taking forward into the next borough strategy which uh, will be a sort of 10-year strategy and then from that uh, Rachel that should be able to give us a, a sense really of what this board needs to be responsible for uh, going forward so so that's the um, that's the annual report for 2020 uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions uh, on that thanks very much Rupert I've got Lucy Hi there. Um, sort of another question again from sort of health health and social care forum uh, a lot of us met yesterday I think Throughout the pandemic, our kind of sector in terms of sort of, um, I suppose, the third sector, voluntary community sector, who are very much working and have continued to work throughout the pandemic with people, as we all have. Um, we've been kind of identified as key to the response and the recovery of Doncaster. Um, but with that, it's, it's what consideration has, you know, the Council or Public Health or CCG had? What's the thinking behind actually resourcing that um, because obviously the demand is going to be higher. Um, I think looking at your kind of six wellbeing goals, uh, we feed as a sector, we feed into absolutely all of them, um, but we can't do it without the resource. So that's a very big question, um, but I just thought it was important to sort of raise at this point, because everything that we've talked about in terms of the sector, everything we've talked about today in terms of carers or um, befriending, physical activity, keeping mentally well, um, working with people who've got drug and alcohol problems, um, support for older people with dementia, all of that in terms of contributing to people's health and well-being, we can do, but only if we have the resource to do it. OK, that's a that's a fantastic uh, <laughs> question. Um, I, mean, I suppose I'd start by saying that, uh, you know, as a sort of set of health of health and care 
partners, we're definitely committed to, you know, the fact that most of our health and well-being is derived from the places where we sort of live, work and play. And the best way to support that is through uh, working close to, to where that is and working through sort of localities. So Jackie in particular has been really keen in terms of steering us towards a sort of locality uh, approach around health and uh, care. So how, how do we link with GP practices? Uh, you know, we've got a range of connectors, but also how do we work with um, organisations like yourself and the broader sector? Uh, I suppose there were definitely some challenges that we've seen to, to do that. And, uh, you know, I think the um, establishment of Voluntary Action Doncaster and starting to resource that is is in that um, direction. Um, I think the ultimate challenge is how do how can we um, move resources around the system? I think that's the ultimate mm. uh, challenge uh, and I think it's going to be a particular challenge uh, going forward. So uh, if the ICS wasn't um, forming and CCGs weren't disappearing, I think I'd be I'd be much more confident in our ability to do that because I know that is a, a, a sentiment that uh, a number of the health and care leaders share locally. Uh, I am worried that um, as the ICS forms, if that means all resources go into South Yorkshire first and then we have to argue for them to come back out to, to mm. Doncaster to go back into localities, then that will be um, that, that that's a, an extra sort of uh, step we have to take. And then I think the other challenge is um, where um, we all, uh, you know, and uh, commissioners uh, in particular, you know, how do we see the, the value benefit of third sector uh, organisations? And uh, I think, you know, it'd be interesting sort of to get um, Richard and Catherine's uh, perspective uh, and particularly maybe Catherine around mental health. So uh, there's obviously a lot of resources come through the national routes, but for very specific clinical mm -hmm. interventions, and that does make it difficult to uh, move resources. But uh, I think what we should be thinking about, certainly in terms of the health and wellbeing strategy going forward, is what it, you know, what is our collective uh, vision, aspiration for the sector, and how do we then resource it mm. in in a way that uh, at least helps us step into that. Um, direction uh, but like all organizations you know statutory and non-statutory we know that resources have been a real squeeze this year thank you thanks Rupert Jackie thanks uh, thanks Lucy it is a really um, big question but a really important question and I um, echo everything that Rupert's just said um, and, and Rupert did say that I'm really keen to get us working in that locality way and I think you know CCGs won't be here after uh, March 22, um, but, there's commission, but there's a partnership we're really committed anyway across providers and commissioners mm -hmm. around really improving outcomes in that sort of locality neighbourhood uh, um, way. And I think next year is a real opportunity before we go to try and make us get moving on some of that. And that's a real ambition that we've got. And what we want to do is target some resources to improve outcomes at that locality level. Mm -hmm. um, now, so, so that's that's one thing. I, th I think there is a bit of what's our level of ambition when we're all trying to recover from COVID and deal with COVID and you know all of those things as well. So there is an, a vaccination programme. So I just think we need to be mindful of that. But I think next year is a big opportunity before um, we, uh, we 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 know we're going this. And then the and in Doncaster also we've got a partnership board that will will um, start to, that has got all of the key partners sat around the table that is making decisions about um, the strategy for health and care services across Doncaster, working with uh, health and wellbeing uh, board colleagues and local authority colleagues. But CAF now sits on there as well from Voluntary Action Doncaster, that's quite new. So we want to make sure that we're absolutely sat around that table. And as the changes um, take place um, through health, um, what we want, and, and as we establish that model in Doncaster, uh, we, we need to make, make sure that that's uh, you, you sat firmly in there and, and continue to do so. So I think um, everyone's up for it and everyone sees how important yeah. it is. 
Uh, we just need to try and bottle mm -hmm. some of that over this next 12 months and make it work really well. And, and I think that's sort of the that, that's sort of what we were talking about yesterday is we feel we feel like everybody really wants to work with the third sector. We feel like we're sort of being invited to the right boards and um, being taken seriously. And everyone recognises the impact. And I'm really grateful for that because I think that's really important to acknowledge. I think it's just the next stage. Of, so how do we actually start? So, so I think the big opportunity out of all of these changes, so we'll yeah. change commissioning and there'll be an ICS and all of those things. Yeah. There's a real opportunity about working across the, uh, the system um, to identify the outcomes and you know we will yeah. get into that at the ICS level but the big opportunity is how providers and partners work together to say how we are collectively going to use the resources we're getting to Doncaster how we're going to make that those services as efficient as possible mm -hmm. and actually who we're going to work with to do that and mm -hmm. that's the opportunity that we've really got to grab hold of and of course so over the next 12 months that, that's the debate that we'll be having and, and voluntary sector should absolutely be firmly in, in that that's, discussion. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. I've got Kath, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just really building on on uh, what's been said, um, I think, you know, um, Voluntary Action Doncaster is now in place and trying to broker those conversations um, and, and build up um, knowledge um, and broker partnerships. Um, I, I think potentially the, the, about un, that understanding of the breadth, depth and professionalism the sector can offer is something that we need to do a bit more mm. informing, influencing, sharing about, um, because otherwise you don't know how what is the correct partnership. Because you know th there's a lot happening and a lot of expertise um, that can provide that wraparound service. Okay, thanks very much. Anybody got any other points of Rupert? Yeah, so just to sort of come back on that a little bit. So I know last month. Uh, we had the Get Doncaster Moving update, didn't we? And some of the involvement of the sector. Uh, previously, this there's been a subgroup of the Health and Wellbeing Board looking at sort of the role of arts and uh, health. Um, and we've not um, had an update from them for a while, obviously because of COVID and everything else. But then I was also thinking about Kath's sort of point about you know what does the sector do and maybe we should think about how we bring something to this board of, around that um, whether it makes sense to do the uh, arts and health first Lucy uh, and then do uh, something broader on the on the sector Kath but I think keeping this learning going in this board would be really helpful so that uh, we can show that you know the, the professionalism that exists in the sector and the outcomes that people are achieving and and the opportunities yeah we that would be absolutely wonderful because i think there's a lot of learning that we've had through the pandemic about the way that we keep connected and creative with participants right across the borough but then there's some obviously health impacts like long covid in terms of stuff that actually the arts can have quite a big impact on so yeah that would be brilliant to be able to do a presentation on that OK, so I'll include that in the next the June meeting, Rupert, yeah. OK, I've got Phil, please. I also, I also liked in the report, um, Rupert, the, the way, I mean, it's a, it's a model a few years old now, it's 2014, isn't it? Because you can, in the diagram you put in. But this idea about health determinants and 20% of health determinants being kind of health and care um, and, you know, um, I haven't got it in front of me, but 40% being pretty pretty material, 30% um, um, being behavioural. Wouldn't surprise me if we overlaid um, VCF input to that. We might find VCF input very overrepresented. I mean, I say overrepresented. I don't mean overfunded, by the way, <laughs> but overrepresented in the areas that actually are required to make the biggest impact. Um, and the rest of us not being proportionately quite as much in those spaces. So I think that's another kind of useful lens to to look at the value of the voluntary and community sector through. OK, Lucy, you've got your hand back up. Did you want to come back? Yeah, it was another question again from Health and Social Care Forum. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone's very engaged this this week. Um, it was 
looking at so we were looking again at Rupert at your report um, and it was again about that 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 picture and the stuff that makes makes us up and we were looking at the socio-economic factors and part of that is around jobs and it is around income uh, so one of the questions was is do commissioners or can commissioners um, allow providers to pay, to pay the real living wage um, especially when we're talking about key workers because that I think that's something that's sort of coming up I mean we as an organization at darts we pay living wage um so it's but it's quite hard sometimes when you're being commissioned for a service in order to be able to 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 commit to a living wage so what do commissioners think about that that's a great uh, question and I suppose we might all have slightly different views as uh, commissioners because of the current rules and uh, restrictions that we we operate uh, under. Um, certainly um, for the more clinical services and there are some clinical services that um, the public health team will uh, commission where we are commissioning from NHS providers there are very clear sort of rules on uh, rates of pay depending on the um, uh, the staffing requirements and the mm. expertise of those uh, staff. Uh, I think the, the, what we're really getting at, I think, is where we're commissioning non-statutory um, providers. Mm. I think currently um, where most of us are at, where we're commissioning new services, we commission against the f uh, financial envelope and we would expect uh, providers to to respond within that. Uh, however, that probably um, doesn't give scope for those sorts of conversations, mm -hmm. uh, Lucy. And there is a mm -hmm. risk that with the, you know, well, it's probably almost certainly happened with the austerity that local authorities are under, you know, there's probably has been a race to the bottom, I would say, certainly in terms of, you know, some of the public health uh, services. And uh, we have, um, as part of the sort of approach to renewal and recovery uh, a number of the directors have been meeting to look at poverty as a sort of key challenge and mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of things that we can we think we ought to be doing and uh, looking at you know um, rates of pay not just mm -hmm. for our own staff but mm -hmm. for people that we commission um, is is something that we could look at but we don't uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure and I'm looking at Phil as I say this I'm pretty sure that we don't have a policy as a council that uh, when we commission services we will pay certain uh, rates there are certain there are other things that exist in um, social care for fees and things like that mm. uh, so, so that would be my opening response but I could see mm -hmm. Phil's itching to get in and get me off the hook uh. I'm itching, I'm itching to put myself on the hook because um, you know it's the masochism of this. I think it's I think it's a good challenge, Lucy, and I, and I don't know whether um, the specific focus was around voluntary and community sector partners or just a general principle. But mm -hmm. I mean, we've been discussing, for example, with our care home providers, our home care providers, yeah. our supported living providers, some of whom are, are voluntary and community um, organisations, many of whom aren't. Um, it would help us as it would help many places across the council if there was a, a long term government settlement around costs of social care. Mm. Um, that would help us a great deal. Um, it's a it's a real challenge at the moment within the financial envelope that we've got for the, for those arrangements to 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 jump to that. But it's not something that we should be trying to avoid. And, I, and I've got no problem with a a conversation here about how how we would get to that point and and comparing what different people are doing on that but it's um mm. there's certainly a restriction on funding but real living wage ought to be something that we, we'd say that everyone in Doncaster was entitled to it's just a question of how to get there I think of course thank you both very much thank you Rupa yeah and, and I suppose just to come back on that then it does uh, link into the sort of the economy and as we go forward so we know that uh, you know a lot of Doncaster people are involved in the sort of healthcare uh, economy third sector economy and seeing it as a circular economy yeah. uh, is helpful in terms of the the development and uh, it's interesting with the treasuries new green book in terms of investments it might mean that uh, you know the investment we put into new roads or new places um, will be looked at um, 
differently and more akin to how we might see investment in uh, real living wage. So I think it's, it's watch this uh, space, Lucy, but it's a good, mm. good challenge. We need to make sure that we've got a mechanism of keeping the, the conversation going. And I think, Rachel, through the inputs then on arts and health and well-being and then potentially on the sector as a whole through CAF, that would be, you know, it's a good place for us to keep this conversation live. Yeah. Brilliant. I think, as, I think as well from a political point of view, if if the wider determinants of health tell us that a, a good job and a good income massively improves health, then you, you would expect that a local authority would want to have that policy statement that whilst we can't influence small businesses, what we can influence are the services that we commission. Um, and I certainly, obviously after May, if we're, we, who knows what will happen, but after May, I think that's the sort of, sort of political pledge we need to make. Because I think picking up what you said, Rupert, we need a rethink, don't we, about health inequalities? Because I've been on the board now four years and you've been doing this an awful lot longer, Rupert. Um, and I think anybody that looks at health inequalities can see that it's very difficult for most areas that have the deprivation that we do to shift uh, substantially, which is what we want to do. So I do think we need that rethink. And I think it is those wider determinants of health that should help us do that. And I think it's an opportunity to be a lot, lot more radical as a local authority. It's all right, the press have gone. As a local authority um, about how we make that happen. Because to be sitting here in four years time, eight years time, and have Rupert do his report and say we need to think differently, then we shouldn't be allowing that to happen, should we? Phil, thank you. Are you going to sack me? <laughs> it's, you know it works the other way around, Rachel. Um, I think it's about being more radical as a as a health and care system, not yeah. just as a local authority. So. Um, um, the, you know, the, Rupert's been the biggest bit of the morning, but Sir Michael Marmot's also speaking elsewhere this morning, and he, he's been asked about what um, what his challenge is to local authorities, and he's expressed the, the need for us to focus on equity. He's been asked what his challenge is for the NHS, and he said to think about um, the health of your population, not just the health care of mm. your population. So I think there's a there's a shared challenge, but hopefully the ICS, if it walks the walk, should help us pick that up. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. It's, it, it, it's absolutely right, and it's, a, it's sort of breaking that cycle, really, because in health, it feels like our, a lot of the money and the resources that we get are focused on treating people who are already ill. And how do we work together so that we can move some of that investment up front? But until we can break that cycle, we're still getting people coming through the system who are ill. Now, you know, it's a big ask, but that is the absolute ambition of the changes that are going to take place in health and the ambition will be and is and we need to grab hold of this is to ensure that the health and care are working together and using their resources collectively and actually that everybody's making and making those decisions about the best place to put those investments and I know Richard's on the call and I always say that one the day that we know we've succeeded really is when we're starting to move shift that money and we, we we're all agreeing we're moving it from acute sort of services in, into up front but we can't do that whilst ever we've got people who are constantly knocking on the door and needing those services so we need to work together it's not just about shifting the money we've absolutely got to work together to create the environment so we can do that we'll, and we can't do that we've got to do that together um, yeah. and, and grab hold of that okay thank you for that jackie i think that gives us certainly all food for thought that we've got to do it haven't we and make that difference any more questions comments from anybody no okay so we are asked to um we are asked to note the report and obviously the call to action as well you expect from us all rupert um and consider how the recommendations can be taken forward in future strategy and delivery plans which i think we've started to talk about in response to those questions from lucy Okay, unless anybody's got anything else to say, I'm going to close the meeting. Um, our next meeting is going to be in June, Thursday the 10th of June at nine o'clock. I'd just like to thank you all because obviously being an elected member, we've got elections coming up. 
it doesn't seem four years ago that I started chairing this board. I've, it's been an absolute joy um, and it's been brilliant to see how we have worked together. And I go on a lot of national things and I hear about all the problems that health and wellbeing boards have across the country, that we don't have anybody from the voluntary sector, we don't have anybody from the police, or we couldn't invite the providers on, that would be dreadful. Um, so I think a lot of those issues we don't have in Doncaster. Um, and I think the next steps in terms of all the healthcare changes, the JSNA, the health and wellbeing strategy, I think we've got a real opportunity next year to, to, to do that radical work and think very differently. And I think, you know, in anything, the commitment has to be there and clearly on this board it is. So thank you ever so much. And I hope that I'll be part of it going forward, but who knows, because I think we've all learned elections are very precarious. <laughs> So thank you ever so much. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Geoffrey. You're still on for attending. Um, and I think going forward, and I know Louise and I discussed this a long time ago, we really should be having um, the lived experience. That should be the focus of, of, of every meeting that we have. Mm. OK, then. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.